step up for each other. I've got your back. You've got mine. Kindness, humility, empathy. It's not just talk. It's who we are. It's who we always have been. And no one can take that from us. The movement to bring it back, it started here. And here. And here. In school gymnasiums, community centers, the living room down the block. You'll be where? Okay, we'll be there. Who are we? We're the movement that will beat Donald Trump. Welcome. We're going to have to sweat for it. We're going to have to sacrifice and fight. We're going to have to lead. Everyone is going to have to lead with kindness, humility, empathy, and not just talk, but action. Action today, action tomorrow. Action until we win. And we will win if we do this together. It's who we are. It's who we always have been. Now let's show them. Thank you for joining this Biden-Harris campaign, New Hampshire Youth Action Town Hall. Please welcome Organized New Hampshire Youth Vote Director, Gabby Finlayson. Hello, hello. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today at our Youth Action Town Hall. As you know, we are just 34 days away from the most important and consequential election of our lifetimes. As young voters, we have so much on the line. There is so much work to be done on these issues that we all care about. And I promise you that that work will be so much easier if we elect Democrats at the local level here in New Hampshire, um, as well as electing Dan Feltis as governor, reelecting our congressional representatives and Senator Shaheen, and of course, uh, get Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House. You know, there are so many issues that we all care about that are on the ballot. Climate change is on the ballot. Healthcare is on the ballot. LGBTQ rights are on the ballot. Racial justice is on the ballot. We have so many other issues as well. Um, and we need to fight for a bold progressive vision for our country. And that starts right here um, with volunteering as well as voting. From record voting turnout to early voting, organizing and engaging with our fellow students, we need your help. We're gonna talk a lot more about how to get involved um, during this last month. But before we do that, um, we have us with, have with us tonight um, some amazing leaders to talk about where we are as a country and a generation, um, including the one and only Chasen Buttigieg, a political science student and U University of New Hampshire um, student, uh, Lily Jackson, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter Nashua, Sam Searles, diversity director for the New Hampshire High School Dems, um, Akanksha, and UNH class of 2020 and democratic activist, Lindy Hamilton. And with that, I have the privilege of introducing our moderator of our town hall. Perhaps the most visible political campaign spouse in the last decade, Chastin Glesman Buttigieg, has built a name of his own as an advocate for teachers, inclusion, and the arts. Born and raised in Traverse City, Michigan, he received his bachelor's of um, sorry his bachelor's degree in theater and global studies from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and his master's in education from DePaul University. Chastin most recently worked as a middle school drama and humanities teacher before joining his husband Pete on the 2020 presidential campaign trail. In our country's biggest cities and smallest towns, Americans were uh, Americans were heartened by his charisma, empathy, and infectious positivity. In his moving and hopeful. Um, and refreshingly candid memoir, I Have Something to Tell You. Chastin shares his story of growing up gay in his small Midwestern town, his relationship with Pete, and his hope for um, America's future. Chastin currently lives in South Bend, Indiana with Peter and their two rescue dogs. His memoir, I Have Something to Tell You, was an instant New York Times bestseller. And with that, over to you, Chastin. Thanks, Gabby. I didn't realize you were plugging the book. That was so kind of you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, everyone, uh, for, for joining us this evening. I am so bummed that I can't actually be in New Hampshire with you because the campaign sent me to New Hampshire a lot, and I love it there. Um, but I'm so glad that we found a way to be connected and connected safely uh, this evening, especially because I know that students in New Hampshire drive a lot of the energy around politics. I felt that a lot. Uh, when I was there on the campaign trail, I do just have to say I have a little beef with New Hampshire. I never saw a moose, not once when I was there. I don't know if that was a personal thing, um, but I do deserve to see a moose eventually sometime in New Hampshire. But uh, we have bigger things to talk about this evening. 
Um, as we all know, as members of younger generations, every generation coming up in America has been handed some sort of obstacle or challenge. And it certainly feels like every younger generation, our generations specifically, have been dealt um, a lot to deal with. Um, especially because of Donald Trump uh, and his failed administration. These last four years, our country has been dealing with a multitude of challenges that will directly uh, impact young people, such as slashing protections uh, for uh, our environment, um, pulling our country out of necessary uh, accords and agreements with other countries. The rise of school shootings uh, hit home very personally to me uh, as a teacher. I'm very tired of traumatizing students in this country with lockdown drills. Uh, and I'm tired of the NRA having such a strong voice in Washington. Uh, LGBTQ prejudice and discrimination is on the rise, specifically in healthcare, especially with this pandemic attacking, uh, attacking trans women of color in this country. Uh, we are now in an economic recession, uh, which you have probably felt as you uh, have pursued summer jobs or you're looking for offers uh, post-graduation. And of course, uh, police brutality around the country. Uh, this president refuses uh, to name systemic racism, to address systemic racism. If any of you survived watching the debate last night, you saw that our president was given an explicitly clear opportunity to denounce white supremacy, and he cannot. Uh, of all of these issues, it seems that President Trump has failed young Americans the most. Uh, and with a little over five weeks to go, we are at risk of another four years of failures uh, from the Trump administration. Um, so it is going to take all of us coming together. The primary season is over. Here we go. We have less than 40 days, uh, I believe. And while I wish we could all be together out in the streets, um, fighting together and, and organizing together, we're going to have to get a little bit creative uh, in the way we do this, uh, because we are also living through a global pandemic that our president hasn't been able to uh, lead through and address. Um, so right now, uh, it's really important that we start thinking about how we are going to have these conversations with people and make them, like that video said, kind, empathetic. Uh, and I believe we do that when we talk to people in our own lives about what's at stake. Um, I like to tell people, especially in my part of the country, in Indiana and Michigan, it is not going to be Project Lincoln that will save us. It's not going to be a sassy tweet and it's not going to be your neighbor's yard sign that changes minds. It is going to be you and people they love or people they trust reaching out in their own communities or families and saying, this is what's at stake for me. This is what I stand to lose. Can we please talk about um, those things that will impact my personal life? Um, especially things like dismantling the ACA and ripping away healthcare, uh, especially uh, right there in New Hampshire. I believe 105,000 granite staters are at risk from having their healthcare uh, stripped away from them. Uh, and that includes college students, because if we rip away the, the ACA, that also means uh, students in New Hampshire will no longer be uh, uh, allowed to be on their parents' healthcare. Right now under the ACA, you can stay on your parents' healthcare until you're 25 or 26 and we lose that as well. So we have to reach out to people and say, this is what's at stake for me. This is what I stand to lose. Tell me what you stand to lose. What do you think you stand to lose or what do you stand to gain? Are you afraid of anything? Because let me tell you what I'm afraid of. And I root all of those conversations in empathy and my own lived experience. Uh, I point to this ring a lot, especially with uh, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, and this extremely a uh, conservative judge that uh, Trump wants to appoint. I am very worried about what the direction of the courts will do to LGBTQ equality and rights, uh, a woman's right to choose uh, her own health care and what happens to her own body. And we have to root these conversations uh, in our own personal lives. You can do something about that right now. Uh, make a plan to vote. I know that's kind of like a buzzword right now, like make a plan to vote, but seriously, what's your plan? Because like I've started making mine, like we're going to drop the ballots off at the clerk's office or we're going to vote early in person and then we're probably going to get donuts. Like expand that plan. Like what's, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to treat yourself? Make it a treat yourself day, but seriously make a plan. Are you going to meet up with a friend for like a socially distanced coffee to celebrate uh, the fact that you are trying to save democracy, but seriously make a plan. You can do that by going to iwillvote.com slash NH. Everyone needs to make a plan to vote. Do not blow it off. We probably spend more time watching Netflix than we do making a plan 
to vote. So you have to do this. We have to save democracy. Um, this year in New Hampshire, any eligible voter may vote absentee because of COVID-19. So it is very convenient to vote early and you can request, fill out and return your ballot in a single trip to your clerk's office. Uh, so your plan doesn't need to involve multiple days. You can go do it all uh, with one easy visit. Uh, and while you're at it, please make sure you're reaching out to the people in your life to make sure they are making a plan to vote as well. It's as simple as texting them saying, I know I'm probably annoying you, but please tell me you've picked a time to vote or have you accessed uh, your ballot. Send them that link, iwillvote.com slash NH. And don't be afraid to pester them because we are trying to save democracy. Uh, but I am not the only person that wants to talk about saving democracy and what is at stake, especially for this generation. Uh, I know we have a lot of brilliant uh, impassioned students who are here to talk a little bit about some of those issues um, that I mentioned, uh, addressing some of the questions that you have submitted. So I am going to pull up these questions. All right, first question is for Lily. So Lily, this question for you is due to this pandemic, our lives have changed dramatically to say the least. As other countries begin to open up and go back to normal safely, we are still living in a country where a significant number of people are dying every day because of COVID-19. How have the failures of this administration impacted you personally? And how would electing Democrats this November change that? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's probably on the minds of every other student that I walk around with every day. And those are blue collar workers and emergency response teams. And as a senior in college, I'm about to enter the job market. And that job market mimics that of the Great Depression, which is terrifying for anyone to think of. And what kind of gives me hope is that Jill Biden is a community college teacher, so she can kind of understand and empathize our positions right now. And Joe Biden went to a state school not too far away from me. So I know what he thinks is a student and what's important to us, and he can advocate for our position. And the Democratic Party as a whole can sympathize with the 99%. And that's the people that are being affected by this pandemic, the 99%. And the US has really dropped the ball on reporting and gathering data and being truthful about what's actually happening because Donald Trump is a scared to panic, panic everyone and um, try and blow out of proportion, which I don't think that you can do in a global pandemic. And it's time to treat it like it is, a very sca scary and dangerous problem that needs to be solved. Absolutely, Lily, especially when we watched the debate last night uh, and we saw how he kind of just batted that away, like he does not even want to acknowledge uh, that he has failed uh, to address this. Um, and so we will do everything we can to make sure that we actually elect leadership, like you said, who sort of understands the shoes that we're sitting in for sure. Um, all right, next, uh, I have a question for Akanksha. I hope I said your name right, Akanksha. Uh, older generations are looking to us, millennials, Gen Z, to be leaders on climate change. Though most of us know how important this issue, we don't know exactly where to start. It can be confusing for a lot of people. So what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get involved in the fight, the fight against climate change? Um, well, I guess the first part is, is like climate change is such like an impending problem. And I feel like we see it everywhere, like posts on Instagram, Twitter being like, the world is gonna end in like seven years. And I feel like the biggest thing I can tell anybody who's big concern is climate change is it's not hard at all to get involved. And it starts by literally just voting for people who actually believe in climate change. People like Democratic can candidates like Amy Custer, Maggie ha Hassan, Jean Shaheen, Joe Biden, people which will actually commit themselves to make a change. The next thing that we can do kind of like as activists for climate change is to always hold large corporations accountable as they account for so much of gas emissions and fossil fuels emissions in this country alone. And a lot of that starts with just looking up and seeing if there's any bills holding large corporations accountable for those actions. That's incredible. And I'm so glad you mentioned that, like calling out the big corporations who are also playing a huge role in this. Like it shouldn't just be on us to, to uh, do away with straws. 
right? Like we all love the turtles and we're going to do our thing about straws, but like we can't be the only ones, you know, taking action here. I love that you brought that up. All right, Sam, it's your turn, your question. It's common knowledge that New Hampshire's public universities have some of the highest tuition prices for in-state students in the country. That being said, tuition prices all around the nation are simply unaffordable. I know I've got the debt to show it. So what can we do to make sure that any person who wants to get a higher education can afford to do so? That's a great question. I know um, I personally relate to this. Um, coming out of high school, I knew I wanted to do something theater related or journalism related. So being, uh, yes, of course. Um, so being uh, in New England, what was my dream school? Emerson in Boston. And um, I was accepted and they gave me $3,000 in a scholarship, even though I was an A student. And I said, what is that going to do other than buy books? And so um, I, I really relate to this. I mean, I spent two years at a state school and then ended up transferring to another school in Boston. But the biggest thing was, I don't wanna be walking into you know, life in the future with a ton of debt. I wanna be able to you know, have a family someday and travel and do all of these things unencumbered by debt that was that I got trying to get to the point that I'm at now, if, if that makes sense. Um, New Hampshire is, <sighs> New Hampshire's main issue, I think, well, not main issue, but one of the biggest ones here, I mean, we just saw it. We don't have a great minimum wage. In fact, we have one of the worst. Uh, we are tied um, for the worst minimum wage. And we just tried to fix it um, on our Republican leadership, shut it down and um, have criticized Democratic leadership for trying to fix it at every turn. And so um, voting for candidates, um, you know, for Democratic candidates up and down the ballot, um, all the way up to Joe Biden, but certainly for our state representatives is a huge um, way to help college tuition become less of an issue, to help debt become less of an issue, to decrease um, the stress, the strain um, of college education um, on young people in our state and around the country for sure. Absolutely. You know, it, it is really personal for a lot of people. And I'm so glad that you brought up the reality that, you know, you're thinking about your future, not just what you're going through right now. You know, Peter and I just this last weekend, we're going over a spreadsheet. He loves spreadsheets, uh, thinking about our budget. And I have a lot of student debt. And we're literally thinking about starting a family. And we also have to look at that debt and figure out how we are going to take care of that. And I don't want that to be a roadblock for you or anybody else when it comes to landing your dream job and starting a family. Um, and it, it it's just um, really sad that we live in a country where our leaders don't um, believe in access to education and believe in making it affordable for everyone, uh, not just those at the top who can cut a check, but everybody who wants to achieve the American dream. All right, Lindy, you are up. All right. Following the recent decision coming out of Louisville regarding Breonna Taylor and a summer of protests following the murder of George Floyd, many non-Black people are confronting and acknowledging systemic racism that Black people have faced for centuries. How can non-Black people be better allies and fight for real, lasting change to capitalize on this movement? And how does voting play into this? Um, yeah, so I think this is a really important question. Um, as a Black woman myself, this is something that I think about constantly. Um, so in terms of non-Black people being better allies, I think using your privilege and platform as a white person in America is a huge part in this to capitalize on this need for change. And this needs to be more than a moment. We need to keep up with this momentum um, of anger we feel and protesting until Black people in this country see the equality that we do deserve. And we need to do better than just ending police brutality. Um, that's the bare minimum. And we need to address the deeper issue of systematic inequality in this country that directly affects Black people and come to terms with the fact that America was built on a system um, that we still use today that is made to keep Black people from advancing in society to the extent that white people are able to do so. Um, so in terms of voting, um, real police form will only come if Joe wins the election. Um, these health inequalities affecting Black people across the country um, that have come with 
COVID and some that have also been here long before this pandemic will only be addressed and fixed if Joe does win this election. And also that equitable recovery. And um, that includes things such as building a strong middle class that includes black Americans where the 1% aren't the shareholders of the majority of the wealth in this country. Um, and that will only come in the next four years if Joe wins this election. So there's a lot riding on this. Yeah, and unfortunately that debate last night, right? You, We literally have one candidate who will acknowledge it and one candidate who won't. Um, and I'm so glad that you brought up privilege. I really do think, you know, this is not an issue that white people can punt uh, over to people of color to solve. Uh, you need to roll up your sleeves and have some of those uncomfortable conversations with people in your life who, uh, who really aren't willing to do the work, who aren't getting there, who perhaps, you know, in places like I grew up, just living in a very comfortable bubble, have never had to think about a world outside of the place they've lived their entire lives and using your privilege pop that bubble and start having those conversations because so many people's lives uh, and livelihoods are riding on the line here uh all right thank you so much lindy samantha here we go following the oh do 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 i think i have a repeat question posted in here so let's jump down maybe uh someone can message it to me. Looks like there was a repeat question posted where Samantha's question is. Um, do, 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 do. Well, why don't we, um, Samantha, maybe, do you wanna just answer the same question? Um, <laughs> sure. Um, I think the biggest thing um, that allies can do um, would be to work on um, educational uh, resources, finding them. Um, I so appreciate people who are coming to me and saying, oh my gosh, like I didn't even know all the stuff that I didn't know. And I'm like, girl, same. Like there was so much that I didn't know until I took an elective course at school last year about my own history because it's simply not being taught, um, which is another reason why education reform is such a huge thing that, um, that we've been pushing for. Um, just in general for a really long time. Um, there are some resources um, that I really recommend. Um, I can put them in the chat. I don't know if I can do that or whatever, um, but just just things that um, that can help. But the, the biggest thing is that there are lists right now that are out. Um, a, a bunch of people have been talking about them. Try to seek it out for yourself first before you go ask uh, your person of color friend to do it for you. Um, there's a lot of emotional labor that comes with, with everything happening all at once. And um, in the time that we, we could be saying, here, here are some resources that have already been talked about in you know, 17 articles here, um, we could be doing some healing and some processing. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is um, definitely seek out resources for yourself, um, but then also you know, follow very, you know, chapters and organizations that you care about. We will always say, come to us, we need help with this. Or, you know, we're looking for people who are good at this. Um, and if you know somebody, you know, or it's yourself, you know, make yourself known and available to us because we need resources as well. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Um, all right. I am bouncing around here because I think I mixed up questions. So Lindy, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Um, many college seniors are entering the workforce, not only during a global pandemic, but during an economic recession. And much of this could have been prevented, um, you know, with leadership. Seems, seems like a basic thing, right? How would electing Democrats in November uh, give our college seniors sort of a heads up, um, especially a leg up on entering the workforce? Yeah, so as we know, we're currently experiencing the highest rate of unemployment since the Great Depression. Um, and recent college grads such as myself are really no stranger to that. It's become a stark reality since late March that while it is hard for people already in blue or white collar positions to keep their jobs right now, um, it's certainly hard to come by an employer willing to hire in the economy that we're in right now. So I think that's a shared experience for us. But um, as bad as this is, I think we need to look at the silver linings. Um, the reality is while many aspects of this pandemic have been out of our control um, and so many things like 
were unpreventable, there are things that are preventable and that can be fixed under a new administration, uh, which would be the Biden administration. Um, we need to get a real stimulus package out to every American over the age of 18 that can actually provide economic relief um, long term. Um, and this can only be made possible under democratic leadership. Um, and if we keep the House and flip the Senate, we can make these things a reality as this would be a huge leg up to recent grads such as myself um, who are stuck with nothing right now but still have loans to pay back and have nothing to show for it. Um, so I know that Joe has a plan to create millions of good paying jobs by tackling areas such as revitalizing American manufacturing, building a 100% clean energy um, economy which would provide opportunities for thousands of new jobs um, and also in importantly, advancing racial equity, um, because as we know, minorities such as Blacks and Hispanics in this country have been so disproportionately affected um, by this pandemic and the fallout of the economy. And so many of them are the first to lose their jobs. Um, so let alone find one right now. So essentially, a Biden administration will be the first step on the road to recovery for this, um, from this economic fallout in general, but especially for us recent grads, and finally give us the opportunity to put um, our degrees and talents to work in a more functioning and sustainable economy. Naps for that. You said it well. Um, all right. Let's, uh, Akanksha, I have another question uh, for you. Um, not to go from a, a bummer to another bummer, but uh, the, the Trump administration, uh, one is just a bummer. Uh, the Trump administration has worked to undermine women's uh, and LGBTQ plus rights through the courts. And, and as someone who's marriage uh, exists in part um, by the grace of one single Supreme Court vote. I know I am thinking about how important it is to elect Democrats up and down the ballot. Um, it is very, very personal to me. I find myself twirling this ring a lot and in, in thinking about what that means. Um, one of the issues uh, that affects so many folks in, in both of these communities is reproductive health care. Uh, and Trump's current Supreme Court nominee uh, would try to end uh, Roe and defund Planned Parenthood, making it difficult for cis women uh, and transgender men and women and non-binary folks uh, to get the access that they need to reproductive health care. Um, and also making sure that health care is not a place where uh, folks are going to find discrimination. Um, so how can we protect all people's rights uh, to quality, inclusive health care? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the question. Um, whenever I think about like Amy Coney Barrett, she's like, she invokes the same response as Betsy DeVos, which is just like pure anger and rage and like all these bad emotions. Like, I just want to scream, but I won't. I won't do it now. I don't want to hurt anybody's ears. But I think like the first thing is that the easiest thing you could do is literally just vote. Uh, Joe Biden, if elected, will most likely not nominate Amy Coney Barrett. And if we get lucky, they might not be able to enter in the nomination before he becomes president. So let's cross our fingers for that. But I think the biggest part is to preserve the rights, the reproductive rights of women, trans men and women, non-binary folk, pretty much any any rights of minorities is to be an ally. I think Lindy phrased it the best way. And so did Samantha, like you have to talk to them and have those hard conversations. I guarantee you that there's at least one family member that like says something that like is very much a microaggression and you just have to be like, that's wrong. Like they're people like us. They, they did not make the decision to be the way that they are. And the best thing to do is be an ally, vote for people who you know are also allies too and be an advocate for those rights. Thank you, Akanksha. Absolutely. I know I grew up in rural, very white, conservative northern Michigan. And sometimes you hear people say things where you're like, Ugh. like, you got to realize that sometimes folks have never left that bubble at all. They've never gotten to see the world like, like you have. Maybe they've never gone to college the way you have. Maybe they've never examined their place in the world. And it is our right, it, it is our privilege to be able to call people out like that, right? We don't have to say like, hey, whoa you're a homophobe or like Uncle Jim, you're a racist, but you can say, oh, actually, here's what I've learned about that phrase. Or like, if you don't mind, if I could just tell you um, what, what I've learned or what I know, and maybe you could consider not using that phrase or not, uh, you know, using that term. And I don't know about you guys, but I've heard too many times white people in Northern Michigan try to be kind when they say, but don't all lives matter? 
And that is our opportunity to say, this is a learning moment and I get to be the teacher, right? You can't shut down because people are depending on you to do that work. Uh, all right, so we are running short on time. So I wanna jump over to Lily. Um, with the recent passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, many young voters are quickly realizing the importance of the Supreme Court, uh, the importance the Supreme Court will play in the fight for progress on all of these issues that we care about. So what are some of the issues you are thinking about in regards to the court? And how will electing Democrats help us keep and honor the progress that RBG fought for? Yeah, the first um, issue that really comes to mind for me is the women's reproductive rights and then um, healthcare rights in general. She's very against the Affordable Care Act, as we talked about previously, which will dismantle healthcare for thousands across New Hampshire. And she has made her stance on access to contraceptives very clear. She's not for it. And she's also um, just very against the women's rights, which is like bold statement to say, but I feel like there's no really for or against. You're either for it or holding us back in the women's movement, generations. And as Joe said, the American people should select um, who they want to represent them. And the Supreme Court is not different from that. And I think it's time that whoever is our next president gets to select the new Supreme Court. Because as we know, Trump wasn't popularly elected. And I don't think he's the most representative of the people. And I think we should take back our government, first of all. Yeah, snaps for that. Don't forget when you are having that frustrating conversation with neighbor Joe or, you know, your uncle or, or whoever is saying, you know, but the president was elected for four years. Don't forget to remind them that voting has already started. Uh, the people are picking the next president right now. So if Trump truly believes that the president uh, should be able uh, to pick the Supreme Court nominee, then don't forget to remind people, I totally agree with you, that people are making their choice already. Voting has already started in this election. Um, that is all for me. I don't wanna keep you all too long. I really want you to jump into this relational organizing uh, program because that is so important. That is how we win over hearts and minds by having those conversations, with people in our own circles and our own families uh, and even amongst our own friends or peers. Uh, so thank you so much for having me uh, virtually back in New Hampshire. Uh, it was nice to see some familiar faces and I hope I get to see you uh, again. Best of luck out there. Uh, I know it can be hard. I know it can be exhausting. I don't know about any of you, but I went to bed with a headache and I woke up with a headache after last night. But people's lives, their livelihood and their rights are riding on all of us getting this right. And I can't thank you enough uh, for doing the work. So thank you so much for having me and I can't wait to see you all soon. Thank you so much, Chastin, for, for taking time to join us tonight and for all of your amazing insights. Um, yeah, thanks again. All right, so we may have heard about relational organizing. Um, you may have heard the term thrown around, um, but what does it really mean? Um, it's really just you organizing your communities, you know, having conversations with your friends, your family, your roommates, your professor, the guy you sit next to in history class, or your barista, or literally like the person that cuts your hair. Anyone that you know that you have a relationship with, um, you should be talking to them about why they should vote for Dems up and down the ballot this year, why it matters to you, um, as Chastin so beautifully um, you know, pointed out, and making a plan to vote with them. Why? Because you are the best messenger uh, for your network. If you have a conversation with your friend about why they should vote and volunteer, it's going to be so much more effective and easier um, than if a stranger was to call them and ask them to do the exact same thing. And chances are your, your friend won't even pick up the phone if, if someone called them that they didn't know. But they're going to be receptive if you talk to them. Um, we also, you know, can't reach nearly as many people, especially students, as you all can. Students, as you guys know, you guys are naturally social, right? You interact with so many people every day um, that we may never be able to reach. But since you all have very unique circles of friends, unique class schedules, unique followers on Instagram and Twitter, um, that's why we need every single one of you to relationally organize. Um, and as Chastin mentioned as well, this is something that, you know, you all may not have done before, and it's never been done at this level. This is not the status quo for how campaigns have been run in the past, but it's what we're going to need to do to win. Um, there are opportunities for you all to learn how to have these conversations um, and chat with other students while you're doing it almost every day in October. Um, but you can also have these conversations anytime. Now, you may be asking yourself, how do I start these conversations? Or what if my friends don't want to vote? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we have put together some scenarios that you know we have all heard throughout our work and that might come up for you um, and how to navigate those conversations. Um, so I called up some of our amazing um, college dem, high school dem volunteers to help us out with a bit of a role play on like how to have these conversations with your friends. Um, first up, we have Meg, who is a member of the St. Anselm College Democrats. Hi, Meg. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, you know, how are you? I'm good. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you're registered to vote. You know, I, no, I'm not. I, I don't think I'm going to be voting this year. Oh, oh, okay. Why not? Well, I just don't really see why it matters if I don't vote. The outcome of the election isn't going to change. I'm just one vote and, you know, it's not going to make that much of a difference. That makes sense. I, I totally see why you think that. But I mean, in such a large scale, it can be really difficult to see why like your one vote would matter. But in New Hampshire and like so many races across the country, the um it, important races are decided by such thin margins. In 2016, we had Gigi, or Maggie Hassan, sorry, only won by like a thousand votes. Hillary Clinton only vote, uh, won by a couple thousand. So if just a couple hundred more college students had decided not to vote, then Maggie Hassan would have lost and Hillary Clinton could have lost New Hampshire. And the outcomes would have changed by just a what seems like a few college votes. So as a college student in New Hampshire, your vote has such a huge impact in deciding the outcome of the key races, including electing Joe Biden for president. So New Hampshire could easily tip the scales this year. Hmm. Well, I guess I can see why that might be important, but isn't Biden already projected to win New Hampshire? You know, none of the polls I've seen are even close. I really don't think it'll matter. Yeah, but Biden is polling really, really well in New Hampshire right now, but that could change any time. If we really wanna make sure that the leaders that we want elected that are talented and compassionate and elect them up and down the ballot, we can't just rely on polling data. We have to make sure that we're voting. Okay, yeah, I can definitely see why my vote um, is gonna matter this year. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about it. And I can't wait to look into all the candidates and cast my ballot. For sure. And don't forget to tell your friends to vote too. It's so, so important this year. Will do. Thank you so much, Meg. And thank you for all the work that you're doing um, at St. Anselm's for Dems um, up and down the ballot. You are absolutely a rock star. So thanks again. Thank you. All righty. Next up, we have um, Alinka, who is on the board of the high school um, Dems here in New Hampshire. Hello. Hi, so Linka. Are you excited for the upcoming election? No, I'm too young to vote. And it's so frustrating because I won't be able to make a difference in this election, even though I know how important it is. I entirely understand. I'm also a high school student and I can't vote yet. And I'm literally counting the days until I will be able to cast my vote. For the record, it's 1,497 days. And we may not be able to vote, but we can still make an impact. Have you ever heard of relational organizing? No, I haven't. What is that? It's all about reaching out to our friends, family, neighbors, teachers, anyone else we know who actually can vote. Now more than ever, we really need to have conversations with people that we know and explain to them why this election matters to us and why they need to use their voices and their votes in this incredibly important election. If we talk to people we know and ask them to vote, it's so much more effective than if a stranger would ask them. And we can have a major impact especially if we can help people who wouldn't otherwise vote or register get to the polls. This is the election of our lives because it's the election for our lives. And we can't vote, but we can definitely get people we know to vote. Oh, okay. I can see how that could be impactful. But I'm a little bit nervous about talking to people about politics. I haven't really been politically active before. No problem at all. I'm actually going to a friend bank tomorrow at 6 p.m and we're gonna go through a quick training session to get comfortable talking about voting and this election before we start calling and texting our friends. Come with me and we learn together. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Um, in that case, send me the sign up link. Will do, see you on Zoom tomorrow. Thank you so much, Alinka, and thanks, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to organize high schoolers all across the state. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, let's head over to Miles from Dartmouth. Um, he is on the board of the Dartmouth Democrats. Hey, Miles. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Gabby. Uh, yeah, let's jump right in. Hey, Gabby, just wanted to check in and make sure you're going to vote this year. You know, like I would never vote for President Trump, but since my first pick dropped out of the primary, I just don't feel that strongly about voting for Joe Biden. Yeah, I can definitely see where you're coming from. Uh, it's tough to lose your first choice. I've been there. But over the last few months, Joe Biden has been one of the few candidates in history to win a primary and then reach back out to make sure progressive groups are heard. That's why all the Democratic candidates not only support him, but are still working with him. Because he's been willing to listen and incorporate the plans of all his Democratic allies, like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, Cory Booker, and of course, Kamala Harris. As a result, we now have a chance to elect the most progressive candidate since FDR. That means addressing climate change with bold action, taking on the NRA and gun safety, addressing income inequality, lifting up communities of color, and protecting health care for millions of Americans. With an election so critical and a candidate who's open and willing to share our vision, we can't afford to have anyone sit out of this election. Could I ask what issues are particularly important to you right now? Hmm. Okay. This is interesting. Um, well, I guess one issue I really care about right now is climate change. It seems like no one is really doing anything to stop it. Okay, perfect. Same here. So I can promise you that if you want to see our leaders take action on climate change, then you need to vote. It's a lot easier to pass climate change with Democratic majorities in the House and Senate and control of the White House. So we need everyone to get out and vote. Plus, Joe Biden's plan to take on climate change calls for bold action to build a 100% clean energy economy by 2050 and to create millions of jobs in this recession while building towards a carbon pollution free power sector by 2035. And that's just the federal government. We need leaders who are ready to stand up to climate change at every level of government. Okay, yeah, I, I can definitely see why my vote is important, especially on an issue like this. Um, I'm really excited to look into all the Democrats running up and down the ballot and to, to get out and vote. Yeah, of course. And uh, be sure to bring three friends with you to vote. We want to make sure everyone gets the chance to participate in the election this year. Awesome. Will do. Thank you so much, Miles. You are doing truly incredible work over at Dartmouth. Keep up uh, the hard work you're doing. Thanks. All right. Last but definitely not least, we have Davis, who is the president of the Keene State College Democrats. Hey, Davis. Hi, Gabby. Uh, it's a great day to be Owls United, am I right? Are you voting in the upcoming election? No, I, I don't really want to vote. I don't want to wait in the lines at the polls on election day. I totally understand that. It will be pretty cold then. Uh, but luckily this year, there are so many easy and convenient ways to vote, either by mail or in person as well. And this year, any eligible voter may vote absentee in New Hampshire, and you can even vote this week. You can register to vote, re request your ballot, and submit your ballot all in one trip to the clerk's office downtown Keene or downtown Keene or anywhere in New Hampshire, or you can request your ballot by mail and vote from home. And on some college campuses, you can even vote early. Here you can register to vote and request and submit your absentee ballot well before the number, November election at iwillvote.com slash nh. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I really thought that I would have to be traveling out of the state if I wanted to vote absentee. Thank you so much for offering to help. I can't wait to get registered. Absolutely. And be sure to tell your friends to vote, vote, vote. Absolutely. Will do. Thank you so much, Davis. Um, the work you're doing at Keene is truly inspiring. And thanks for taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you, Gabby. Um, and thank, I want to just thank all the, our amazing activists who are here and were willing to do some role play with me. Um, I thought it would be so helpful to kind of explain like what these conversations can look like um, because they are so critical, but can, you know, maybe be a little bit intimidating if you, if you haven't done them before. So thank you all again so, so much. Um, you know, I, I want to take some time now to hand it over to um, Laura Halliday. She is absolutely amazing. She's one of our interns. Um, I would love to, to pass it over to you, Laura. Hi guys, um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Laura, a sophomore at the University of New Hampshire and an intern with Organize New Hampshire. I remember the feeling of absolute shock watching the results roll in on the night of the 2016 election. I went to bed assured by Don Lemon that the polls would turn around in favor of Hillary. When I checked my phone the next morning, I couldn't help but cry. How could our country elect a man with so little regard for other people, especially those with deferring views? Even worse, how could people have cared so little they refused to vote? In the weeks following the election, I quickly realized much of the country shared my astonishment. I watched women come together and march in Washington, D.C. to not only voice, but shout their concern to our new president and the entire world. 
I watched Democratic Congress people and senators, including Senator Harris, take on nominees and stand up for their constituents. I no longer felt so powerless, and I was inspired to do all I could to stop a repeat of 2016. If there's one good thing to come from a Donald Trump presidency, it's the activism he has spurred. I see it in all of you who took the time out of your day to listen to our panel. I'm fighting to ensure we do not see another four years of Trump and we instead reinstate leaders who actually care about us. Leaders who have vowed to enact measures to protect our environment, address systemic racism in our country, protect the rights of all people, including women and immigrants, and simply put, restore decency. I know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the right leaders for this country and the people we need in the White House to achieve this. And of course, we need to elect all Democrats running up and down the ballot here in New Hampshire. With 34 days until the election, it's time to take our activism offline and make concrete efforts to ensure we make a difference and make our voices heard. It is especially important for students to vote. If every single person watching now not only votes, but commits to getting their friends to vote, youth vote in New Hampshire could truly change the outcome of this election. That starts now. I'm asking all of you to think through your plan to vote. Are you going to vote early by casting your absentee ballot at your town clerk's office, by mail, or in person on election day? While you're at it, take your phone out right now and text three of your friends here in New Hampshire and help them make a plan to vote too. You need every young voter in the state to vote. And as you know, you're the best messenger to your friends for why they should vote. Some schools are even holding voter registration and early voting events on campus. For more information about those events, or if you have any questions about voting, go to voteinnewhampshire.org. Oh, sorry, voteinnh.org slash college. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this event. And I hope to see you at one of our upcoming volunteer opportunities, including tomorrow's friend bank at 6 p.m. You can sign up in the chat. Thank you so much, Laura, um, and thank you for being willing to share your story. Um, I know that the first time that I heard your story, it was incredibly relatable, and I think a lot of other young people and students can definitely relate to that feeling of wanting to, to make sure that we do everything we can, you know, to, to make sure that we don't have a repeat of how we all felt the morning after the 2016 election. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Laura, you are absolutely right that, you know, we can make a difference and we can fight for what we believe in. And that totally starts with voting. And before that, talking to your friends and family about voting too. With only 34 days left to make a difference, please, please, please join us. Use your voice and your vote to make a difference. Um, thank you all so much again for joining us tonight. And I hope to see you all at one of our volunteer events very, very soon.